Okay, welcome back everyone. So this is stage one, which is the talking about the API first design section. So the upcoming talk will be done by Jen May, Porter Lead APIs at DocuSign. He will be talking about the API design in FinTech, their challenges and opportunity in the next gen APIs. So let's welcome Germany. Hello everyone, it's great to be back at API Days Hong Kong. This year I'll be talking about API design in uh, FinTech. We're gonna basically go through a bit of modern history of FinTech APIs, some trends and tips for those building APIs in the FinTech space, and also a little bit of future prospects, what may be coming in the FinTech industry. Quick intro to myself. I basically have been working in the API space for a little over 15 years now in a range of industries, but quite heavy on the FinTech side and generally heavy on the B2B side. Uh, most notably, I built out the original developer platform at Box. I also managed the developer platform for TradeShift, a supply chain company at the time focused on invoicing and very heavily focused on working with payment services and other FinTech APIs. I also led the product organization and uh, APIs over at Deserve, a credit cards as a service company. Um, and I've been a mentor and an advisor to numerous startups and startup accelerators, either focused on APIs or focused on FinTech, like the FinTech Portfolio, NextCubed, and NASDAQ. Currently, I'm working on an API initiative at DocuSign, I'm part of the, the developer experience team, helping to support uh, API governance as well as our SDKs. But today we're focused on my time in the FinTech industry and what I've seen then and what I'm generally seeing. So let's first go through a little bit of ancient history, I like to say, on FinTech APIs. In the world of FinTech, they actually had some of the earliest forms of electronic messaging, most notably the Electronic Data Interchange, EDI, this area. And uh, this thing actually, in general, if we talk to people who've worked uh, on EDI, I, I don't meet too many who actually like EDI, uh, except for this person. This person actually liked uh, EDI. Just kidding. And basically, EDI was a uh, nightmarish legacy system for those who've actually experienced it. On the other hand, although many of us speak negatively of our experience working with EDI, it actually set a good precedent and was quite innovative for its time. It was a means of various systems in banking and brokerages to actually exchange information through some sort of a standardized format. So this really predated APIs, but was quite an innovator before we had the technologies that we had today, even though it was a pain to use. Now, if we flash forward a little bit more, do we see any like great improvements in FinTech to modern APIs? Well, there was a little bit of a lull actually. If we go into the less distant past, like around 15 years back, uh, it was quite common to see site scraping because, well, we didn't really have direct access to APIs among many financial institutions with whom we wanted to work. So companies like Mint.com, a personal finance company that could provide you with guidances in your finances, look at your um, earnings, look at your costs, um, look at your expenses basically, and help you out with personal finance. Well, in order to connect to your brokerages and your bank accounts, you basically would have to share with Mint all of your passwords. Uh, besides the security issues here, well, if you change your password at any of the banks, you know, the integration stopped working. And sometimes Mint just wouldn't work at all because it was site scraping and maybe the bank changed something on their website. So why did we have to rely upon these sorts of integrations, integrations that were not secure and, and not very reliable? Well, to understand what's going on, you know, let's get the bank's perspective at this time. Uh, which is basically, screw you all who want to work with our APIs. Um, well, what was basically going on was that banks were a little bit of a laggard in opening up. They wanted full control of their data, not just for security. Some of it was a, you know, part of the business. They didn't want, you know, their data to be, act to be accessible. Other companies and other industries learned of the power of opening up and basically sharing is caring but not necessarily the banks. They were more 
um, secluded, more isolated, and more difficult to work with for quite a while. Until the law came along. Basically, regulation ended up forcing APIs. In the United States, most famously open banking, which was an initiative requiring banks to basically support greater financial transparency and making their data generally more accessible to customers. Over in Europe, there is the PSC2 standards, so regulation for electronic payments that basically was about making payments more secure in Europe, but also designed to really boost innovation and help banks to adapt to new technologies. Now, none of these regulatory requirements actually formally required the use of APIs, but they basically told banks that they needed to make information more accessible to consumers and give them more ownership of their own data. In other words, the best solution to these new laws was to have APIs. So thanks to these new laws, we can now work more reliably through APIs to work with all these financial institutions. Instead of having to site scrape, hey, these banks have actually moved very quickly to OAuth, so we don't have to pass passwords around. So newer technologies, modern APIs being implemented, and of course requirements that banks actually indirectly provide APIs has led to integrations with financial institutions that are more usable, more reliable, and also more secure. Which is my opportunity to make a random quote from Austin Powers that it's really quite a groovy time. Yes, indeed. Um, anywho, um, in the end, like basically this regulation requiring require the opening of APIs, uh, which you know help to allow for integrations. It does, though, not necessarily set a specific standard around the APIs. But it does mean that we're going to see more APIs in this space with the financial institutions opening up, but also other new companies just focused on fintech providing nice APIs. And now there are a lot of really good companies in the fintech space who, you know, besides the banks opening up, have actually provided very high quality APIs. Um, these have been built by people who basically really know how to build good APIs. So basically, it's a good time for the fintech industry and actually a good time for APIs in general. While the banks have been difficult until now, we can see very good talent coming into the space and proving in the market the value of having good quality APIs. We can really see how the bar is high, though, for fintech APIs. Stripe, for example, is credited for basically being the founder of that elegant three-column documentation we like to see in modern API documentation. In fact, besides documentation, when in doubt, it's fairly common to when figuring out what we're doing with our APIs, when in doubt, just ask, what would Stripe do? Or at least what would Stripe have done when they were in our stage, uh, that room with our APIs, if we're in an early stage company or a later stage? Uh, basically, the fintech companies have actually become the leaders when it comes to quality API design and developer experiences in general. So that means that when you're in this space, you know, you have to, you're in a space with a high bar. So you have some good benchmarks on the other hand, and maybe competitive, you may be expected to provide a high quality developer experience, but you have some good companies you can follow. And ideally, in the world of fintech, by providing high quality APIs and ideally some consistent APIs, we can make integrations within and across this industry easier and better quality. Speaking of standards, well, again, as open banking did push for APIs in general, it didn't provide any specific details around the APIs. In other words, those laws didn't set any requirements that would lead to, say, API standards. And we look around at uh, industry standards today, we actually do see some things in the fintech space, although from the olden days, like for credit card processing, we encountered ISO 8583, basically a messaging standard for credit card processing. Um, and then, of course, ISO 222, uh, actually, I think it's just 20022. This is the standard, also known of EDI, the experience we don't like, but again, it was historic and it, it was an innovator for its time. So in FinTech, we do have messaging standards, but more in the old systems. When it comes to 
better general data access and REST APIs, well, we have regulations requiring these APIs at a high level, but in other words, when it comes to API design, we don't really have rules. We have more guidelines. Now, there has been a dream of seeing APIs be more consistent across various industries, including fintech. It's not just about all our APIs being RESTful, but of doing similar things looking the same. So if we're integrating with multiple fintech companies, we can do so with less effort. And I do see some patterns forming, uh, which can help many of us if we're integrating across fintech APIs. Um, unfortunately, nothing has been formalized, in my opinion. So we haven't gotten to that point where we really are seeing the same API designs across companies. Unofficially, we do see a little bit actually going back to the financial institutions, the banks and the brokerages, because with the open data requirement, these companies had to resort to third parties like SWIFT to help them to create solid APIs. And if they're going to the same organizations to create their APIs, naturally among the, uh, the financial institutions, we would actually see consistently API designs uh, of, a, of a certain consistency. For others in the fintech space though, I'm hopeful that we'll see more. And there are many APIs to look at, many high quality APIs to look at. Um, what I'd like to do today is look at a few of the top quality APIs, most notably Stripe, Square, Plaid, Marketa, the best brand names in the fintech industry. Let's look though at patterns and trends, standards or not, what are we seeing that set a high quality standard, but also any sort of consistency in the designs of these APIs. So for those of you who are building your own API in FinTech, you can look at these and try to support consistency in any future um, efforts to work consistency among FinTech APIs. So as a start, there are certain cases where I have seen consistency across all of the major brand FinTech APIs. In particular, this comes up in API properties. Uh, for example, when it comes to currency, really across the board, although again, the, the open API standard doesn't specify any rules for currency. They do give um, types and formats that are numeric, but there isn't actually a currency format. That said, if we look at the top APIs, at least Marketa, Plaid, and Stripe, they've all consistently moved towards integers for currencies. No decimals, no floats. Why? It's easy to calculate, it's easy to store, it seems to work consistently across different types of currencies. So this is an interesting one because so many FinTech startups I know initially look towards um, a floating point operation for their, um, for their, for their uh, floating points for their currency properties. But in actuality, the big fintech companies have moved towards um, integers. Something interesting to watch and which I encourage other companies to follow. Where, unfortunately, I don't see as much consistency across companies is in endpoint naming or the model definitions within the open API schemas. Um, what I do still see is a well-designed RESTful APIs across the board, or in some cases, GraphQL APIs, especially if you're checking out Braintree. Um, and, but I do see, for any one of these companies, consistency within their own APIs. So I'd say here, just go with good standards, be RESTful, go with GraphQL standards, try to make your APIs at least consistent across your own APIs. But also keep a lookout. See if anything is trending in API model designs and if there are any models that may be reusable or any endpoints that may be consistent in pattern over the next few years. What I also see are certain unique properties that are always showing up in FinTech. It's not exclusive to FinTech, but it's pretty much commonplace in FinTech, especially item potency. Um, so this is about really having consistently in security and reliability. So in terms of raising the bar, a big item here is just the ability to make sure that when a developer is making a post request, they're not accidentally doing it twice, like creating an extra credit card charge or an extra payment. 
Uh, in this space, it's really important to make sure that you don't have duplicate operations by accident. So they're all really big on providing an item potency option for their post requests within their APIs. I also see consistency in authentication, uh, namely going to a known standard for APIs, uh, OAuth. Yeah, OAuth is the most popular standard, but I don't actually see it all the time in, in APIs. Um, I do see though OAuth 2, and in fact OAuth 2 with encrypted signatures. Encrypted signatures are not a requirement of OAuth 2, but fairly consistently the FinTech APIs provide it as a requirement anyways. Uh, that said, I don't actually see OAuth all the time among FinTech APIs. It surprised me considering the benefit to security, but it made sense when I looked at the different use cases. OAuth certainly is the case for anything client to server, like Stripe JS. If you're embedding something on your own website that's making a direct call back to Stripe or Marketo or Plaid, yeah, there's going to be OAuth there. Very often integrations in FinTech don't happen that way. Much of them are happening server to server side with a large enterprise partner or enterprise customer making the calls from their own backend and having minimal consumer interactions client side, perhaps without any actual authentication directly with the partner. We don't actually OAuth to Stripe as a consumer, for instance. As a partner then, I need a way to make calls consistently and simply from server to server. Here, I commonly see basic authentication. In fact, when looking at Marketa and Stripe and others in FinTech, we'll see a combination of basic authentication and OAuth depending on the API product that you're using. Namely, if you're obtaining administrative access that is intended for server to server operations, that's basic authentication. OAuth comes along for something with client-side JavaScript, a pre-made component Meant to be host, meant to be displayed on a partner's website for a consumer to uh, to experience. We see this with Stripe Connect, um, Marketa.js, uh, and other client-side copy and paste widgets. So we see basic authentication where it makes sense, OAuth as much as possible, and also this challenge of administrative tokens and client-side tokens with a different scope. So let's talk about admin tokens and scopes and permissions. What's also very common is for a company to be making an operation server side on behalf of the consumer. Like at Marketa, they may have to make API calls to represent debit card transactions. The consumer doesn't have to know about Marketa, but these operations are being performed by Marketa on behalf of the consumer. So here, authorization really comes up, and the solution is sometimes debated. Um, but in general, what we've seen is the use of administrative tokens to manage users, handle things server-side, server whenever performing an operation on behalf of an individual user. It's common to, rather than just take that one access token you have as administrator and make a call to do something in a user's account, to obtain a restricted user level access token. This really is consistent. Some of it is for security. Some of it is just based on the customers that we encounter where they may have many developers on different teams. They wanna make sure that different parts of the code only can access what they should be allowed to access. And having a restricted access token helps to ensure that the code doesn't go out of bounds but it arguably relates to compliance and, and regulatory requirements as well. In the credit card space, for instance, there's PCI compliance, compliance, payment card industry compliance. And there, there is a requirement that we restrict access to cardholder data by business need to know. Such a policy would basically say that you cannot have an access token that can access too much user data. If you want user data, you need to provide a restricted access token so that the right part of the business can request the data only as they need to know it. All right, so there's um, endpoint definitions, there's properties, there's OAuth and, and, and access tokens and security. Besides API design, there is also some consistency in the functionality of the developer experience like having sandboxes. This I see almost 100% of the time in FinTech. 
basically, if you're trying to test an application that you've built that performs payments, credit card transactions, you're going to want to have a way of testing that without actually having money flow in case you make a mistake in your code, which is common when you start development. So sandbox test accounts going beyond mock servers just let you test that the API calls are working at all and actually working with basically fake data, it really is a must in FinTech. So soon you're going to have to go ab above those basic mock servers, those automated mock servers you can, you can auto-generate and have a framework for a sandbox environment. I've been talking a lot about consistency, and we've seen some consistency. We've seen some inconsistencies that may be trending in time. What else can we do? What else are we seeing that may help to achieve that dream of consistency in the industry of fintech APIs? Again, the open banking standard doesn't really push that, but we are seeing some efforts. You know, the companies that are providing API solutions to financial institutions for open banking, naturally they helped us to establish API consistency. But is there anything we can do to incentivize API consistency? And this is where I just love to talk about Plaid. Plaid had been a great connector solution for consumers to interact with various um, financial institutions that they work and use them within all of these financial institutions. But as Plaid grew, they took the opportunity to help to push a standard, launching something called Plaid Exchange. Plaid Exchange is basically allowing, after Plaid implemented various integrations with many, many banks and brokerages, they allowed any other bank who wants to integrate with Plaid, who hasn't gotten to already, to build the integration themselves but they do so by designing their APIs in a standard that Plaid requires in order for Plaid to work with them. So by utilizing the leverage that they've achieved, they've been able to push by incentivizing, by giving institutions an opportunity to have APIs of a consistent design by working with Plaid. So as you work on your own APIs, I encourage you to A, keep a lookout to see what is trending, what patterns are happening so that you can support them but also see if there's anything that you can do to actively encourage API consistency among the other APIs that you may be working with in this industry. So thank you all for your time. Again, let's help to keep the bar high in the FinTech space, collaborate with other experts in this space, and hopefully we can continue to create an even better ecosystem of FinTech APIs. Have a good rest of your time here at API Days Hong Kong. Thank you, Jeremy, for his sharing. And then we come to the next one. So let's welcome Sean, the Senior Solution Architect at F5. He will be talking about the Hawassing data for everyone's API security and governance. Thanks, Sean. The API Connect Hong Kong 2023 conference is powered by Novelty Limited. Check out more API-related education content on bnovelty.com or apidays.hk for more information.